We're going to yeah. have to. All right, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> See? <laughs> Can I bring to you the state treasurer? You got to bring in the horns, too. <laughs> Mr. <know>. Riley Moore. <laughs> yeah. Good morning, Riley. How are you? Oh, doing great. The state is in the black right now. Uh, yeah, we're doing well. <laughs> See, it makes sense from a treasurer's context. We're in the black. It does. Hey, uh, speaking of having money, you've been returning some to some folks who didn't know they had it coming to them. I've been uh, watching these press releases you've sent out. Your previous uh, office holder there, your, your, the fellow who preceded you, John Perdue, uh, he had done this as well. And uh, tell people how they can find out if the state actually is holding money for them. Where do you check on that? <laughs> Yeah, so you can go to wvtreasury.com. Each state has this. It's called unclaimed property. So say a bank account goes dormant for a certain number of years. There's laws in place that dormant bank accounts uh, that have not been acted on in years will then be turned over to the state. Then it's the state's responsibility, my responsibility, to either find that account holder or the next of kin. And um, we have broken records. Uh, month in and month out now in terms of unclaimed property being returned. Uh, we changed the way that we've been advertising it. We've been a lot more aggressive in trying to get property uh, and money back into the uh, rightful owner's hands. And uh, we had a really interesting one there in Mannington. Uh, gave a million dollars to a middle school library that was part of a trust that was started in the 1950s. Uh, and had been essentially kind of dissolved. Somebody smartly, though, uh, decades ago, had bought stock, uh, included it, and put that into the trust in ExxonMobil. Oh, my. And uh, that had uh, obviously gone pretty well, and subject to the uh, requirements of the trust, those dollars uh, are mandated to go to that library. We liquidated those securities, and... Uh, we're able to give those dollars to Mannington Library. The trust, by the way, was started by the first woman to ever go to medical school in West Virginia in 1896, Phoebe Moore. Wow. No relation that I know <laughs> yeah. of. No relation. You never know, though, Riley. You, you never know. Uh, my great-grandmother was born in Mannington, so I don't know. Wow. Yeah. Be worth doing one of those uh, Ancestry.com things, maybe. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm not letting people get my DNA. Okay, <laughs> okay. You know, hey, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story about that. It's disturbing, but kind of funny. Uh, in this sense, my uh, brother-in-law's niece was okay. getting married, and they had sent in a deposit to a DJ in Pennsylvania, where they live, central Pennsylvania, and a week before their wedding, the DJ was arrested for murder from a murder that was committed 20 years earlier. Oh, my God. And the, and the way they found the evidence was from one of those Ancestry.com DNA samples, and it matched this guy. the evidence that they needed. It was the missing link, and the DJ was arrested, I think, a week before their niece's wedding. Wow. Yeah. That's what's, crazy what's, stuff. Whoa. What's crazy about that? That's this? unbelievable. That's why. And then you were a DJ for that wedding, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was an emergency. Sorry, call. I was waiting for the sort of the kicker there. <laughs> no, the, the, the kicker is what Riley mentioned there about not having letting someone else have your DNA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, th there's a, you know. You know, it doesn't even have to be your DNA, though. <laughs> yeah. It could yeah. be a relative, you know. Uh, it could be, you know, someone that's uh, just in your family lineage and it'll yeah. it'll match up it'll show you you know my sister she did uh one of those 23 and me's and yes you know i i was like well there goes you know our whole family you know <laughs> it'll be clones of us later mm -hmm. on right let, let's let's talk hey let's talk hope scholarship because i know you're sending checks out for the hope scholarship too now yeah we are uh the, so the payments Finally, we're past this injunction. We won in the Supreme Court, uh, represented by our great Attorney General, Patrick Morrissey. We prevailed in the Supreme Court. Injunction was lifted. Program is now up and running. And so finally, we've been able to distribute the funds, um, and not only just distribute funds to uh, people for the uh, upcoming semester, but we actually did... Uh, 
prorated funds or if they'd gone all the way through, say, like private school, individuals that had been approved for Hope Scholarship and then, of course, the Hope Scholarship injunction was placed on it, but then still chose that uh, private school or homeschool path. We're doing back pay for them, so we're making them whole as well. So now that had to get approved by the uh, Hope Scholarship Board, which I chair. I offered that rule. It was voted and passed. And so we're able to make individuals and families uh, whole that had footed the bill in that last semester. The government, obviously, we've made a promise to them, and I'm here to fulfill it. So uh, we're very excited for this program to be up and running. That's wonderful. Um, I, I kind of want to change the tone a little bit. West Virginia doesn't really lead uh, in the forefront of anything, and um, it's rare that we are, you know, a, a national leader. But luckily, because of your office and and your hard work, um, it seems that you were the first to actually divest from BlackRock um, and fight back against, you know, this kind of ESG movement. Do you want to uh, speak to the viewers a little bit about that and maybe explain it? Um, yes. You know, it's interesting you bring that up because this week is the one-year anniversary of uh, me divesting from BlackRock. And I was the first state treasurer in the country. We were the first state to divest from BlackRock. We've now had eight states that have done that. Uh, we went on to pass legislation called the Restricted Financial Institution List uh, subsequent to that that any financial institution that's boycotting the fossil fuel industry that um, we had reviewed was put on a list that prohibits them from bidding on contracts, uh, financial services contracts in the state of West Virginia. And if they had a current contract, that contract was terminated. BlackRock was obviously on that list. J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs. And um, we've now seen that exact same thing now happen, that restricted financial institution list in Texas, Kentucky, uh, Tennessee is going to be coming out with theirs, Oklahoma. And I've been working with state treasurers from around the country, this coalition that I started a year and a half ago. This has been a, 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 a long, uh, hard push on this to get all of this in line. Uh, we are continuing to push back on this. ESG nonsense that is, in short, the idea around ESG is for dollars to chase ideas instead of returns. And those ideas are the left political agenda. So this is a merger of corporate and left-wing power to be able to get their agenda over the line outside of the electoral process because they're not able to pass it as a ballot box, which we do have uh, another piece of anti-ESG legislation that I have uh, proposed this year. We think it's going to run pretty soon called the Second Amendment Financial Privacy Act, uh, which does a number of things. But what's happened now is credit card companies and banks have put in a new MCC code. Uh, that's a merchant category code for firearms and ammunition specifically. And this is to create a national gun registry. And so financial institutions would have the ability to flag what they deem is suspicious activity. They're not the government, right? What, why mm -hmm. do they have any business in that whatsoever? So we are going to stop that in West Virginia. We're not going to allow that to happen. And this is another way West Virginia is going to be leading the way. We're going to be the first state, I think, to get this done. That's incredible. Absolutely. Um, and just to uh, add to it, I mean, you know, ESG, it, it impacts the cost of goods and services. It plays a role in inflation, damages global competitiveness and discriminates against contractors and climate outcomes. So uh, uh, in your congressional run, is there more uh, uh, that you think that you can bring at the forefront in the uh, federal office, you know, in that seat? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. There's a number of things that need to be done on the federal level. While at the same time, obviously, we're going, if I am elected, we need to respect federalism as well. So we don't need to go in here and start telling states what they need to do with their pension funds. But what we do need to have take place, uh, there's a part of law that's called ERISA. And ERISA governs private pension plans. And what we're 
what I'm focused on, and I've talked to a lot of members of Congress about this. Andy Barr's introduced a bill on this. He's from Kentucky. He asked me to endorse the legislation. Uh, I'm going to be doing that this week. What it's going to do is saying, look, there's, you can only look at risk and return as it relates to pension funds, private pension funds. And why this is important for the states is that it's getting rid of, because many states adopt ERISA standards. They, many states have, I mean, adopt ERISA standards. We're not, the feds wouldn't be pushing it down onto the state, but they can adopt those standards. So if you're just talking about risk return, what are called pecuniary factors, and not looking at things like social risk, environmental risk, all these other risk profiles that don't have anything to do with maximizing the return for a pension beneficiary. So that's a big deal. Secondarily, and I've got about 10 of these, but I only do a couple for you. <laughs> uh, secondarily, uh, the rating agencies like S&P Global, they have now put in place ESG scores for every state and municipality around this entire country. So a state like West Virginia, finances could not be better, but we have a bad ESG score due to things. They, they cited these things, rain, flooding, and demographics or things that we have problems with, apparently, in West Virginia. It's absolutely ridiculous. Even though our finances could not be better, we are likely going to face a bond rating downgrade from S&P Global here Mm -hmm. in the very near future due to ESG, which then is going, that ESG scoring, which is going to cost us more money to build roads, hospitals, schools. This is economic extortion. If we don't fall into line, and what they want us to do is get rid of some of our fossil fuel industries, obviously, and fall into line with that, they are going to punish us financially. So that's something the, the, the Congress, the federal government, and it would have to happen at that level. There's not much the states can do on that. Now, there's a number of different things as it relates to proxy voting, antitrust, and a number of other issues, but this is certainly something I'm going to be very laser focused on if I'm so fortunate to be elected to Congress. So I have a question in regards to the folks behind the ESG movement and the ratings and whatever. And I I just kind of find it ironic. You know, the movement to the electric car, for instance, I'd love to not be able to have to buy gasoline again. But I also recognize the fact that when I get that car home, I've got to plug it in and I got to get electricity to charge my car. Where does that electricity come from, Riley? Does it come from the well, sky? Does it coal. fall from the sky? <laughs> it, it actually comes from coal and natural gas. That is where electricity comes from. It, is, it comes from fossil fuels when you plug your car in. Uh, there's actually a couple, I think it was Chevy, was uh, previewing one of their new uh, electric vehicles, and one of the reporters asked, where does the electricity come from? I'm like, well, it's actually mostly coal. Um, <laughs> so so how, can you not, admission, how can you not recognize that if you're the person or, or the group behind this ESG movement, well, you get in your electric car and feel great when you drive home, but you got to plug it in. How do you how do you come up with this ESG movement when it's the same thing? Well, that's what they're trying to move us away from, though. They're trying to r- remove what is a cheap reliable source, consistent reliable source of electricity that powers the grid in this country, which is fossil fuels and also nuclear being a part of that as well, and replace it with inconsistent, unreliable, and intermittent power that comes from wind and solar. At at a minimum, you go look at this, it's just supplemental at most, and the cost of it just does not make sense most people don't realize this, but because of the intermittent nature of wind and solar, that electricity can't, ha- can't travel on the same type of transmission lines. You actually have to tear down all the transmission lines that we have and put up new ones. If that's how you're going to power the grid, it will cost billions <clears throat> and billions and billions of dollars to do this. It doesn't make any sense. And the last thing I'd say, 3%. Three percent of the entire world's electricity comes from wind and solar. That's it. That is it. Forty percent in 1980 of all electricity came from coal. That number today is still 40 percent. Wow. 
Hey, Damon Wright on our Facebook page has a, th- a question for you, Riley, in regards to tracking of purchases. He says, don't they track all of our purchases? Aren't various purchases coded in their systems? Why would firearms somehow be different? Yes. Yeah, so right now, firearms, it's more broad, right? It's uh, coded as sporting goods. So Elizabeth Warren and uh, 28 other members of Congress sent out public letters to banks and credit card companies to push them to specifically track, have an MCC code for guns, and then to have an MCC code in place for ammunition specifically, which has never existed before. That's never existed. And let me just outline real quick what this bill is going to do. Just hit the highlights just real quick. One, it's going to prohibit any financial institution from unlawfully, and this is what we define unlawfully, disclosing a customer's protected financial information. So that would be a purchase of guns and ammunition. Secondarily, what this is going to do, any financial institution that has prohibited a uh, uh, by using a firearms code in a discriminatory manner towards a merchant or an individual won't let them uh, purchase guns and ammunition or won't let that transaction take place at the terminal, they'd be in violation of this act. And what this is going to do, this bill, is going to uh, create a cause of action. There's going to be civil action for uh, liquid, liquidated, uh, liquidated or uh, uh, damages against any financial institution or government entity that's violated this act. And finally, uh, it does permit me as the state treasurer to disqualify any financial institution from the competitive bidding process if they violate this bill. So we are going to allow people – if their Second Amendment rights have been violated, to be able to sue any of these financial institutions. And then if they have violated this act, they will be prohibited from bidding on any contracts moving forward. Any final questions for Treasurer Riley Moore? Uh, very quickly, because you got about a minute, Riley. So how do you balance... Um, you're the person who was on before you, J.B. McCuskey, talked about um, running and how the the window is so is so much wider now that you announce and it could be who knows how long before you actually run. How do you balance your current job with um, with running for Congress? Well, you know, you don't really sleep, but uh, that's kind of part of it. <laughs> As the but, morning guy, I can uh, tell you that's overrated. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, look, what I do is I'm here, I'm doing my job, and I think as long as my record continues to speak for itself, which I think it does, I'm an America First conservative. I have been the leader in pushing back against ESG in this country. And if that's what people want to see more of, I think they're going to vote for me. So I'm here doing my job to the best of my abilities, protecting the interests of the state uh, of the state of West Virginia and its citizens and also its constitutional rights. Obviously, I do get around uh, the district uh, in my free time, but I'm still laser focused on this job. Okay, thank you. Alonzo, Um, I mean. Really quickly, I know you have a, a master's degree in strategic security studies and, in uh, you know, specified in, like, national defense. Do you think that's going to translate well when you, uh, you know, if you are elected to Congress? I, I think it will because uh, an issue that I'm going to be very focused on is China. Look, mm-hmm. the U.S. economy and the Chinese economy are decoupling at a rapid rate, but the Chinese are decoupling from us faster than we are them. This is a national security emergency. Mm -hmm. We have to do something immediately to get away from China. We can't have antibiotics manufactured over there. We got to bring back semiconductors and microchips being manufactured in Taiwan, China, in case they invade. We've got to protect this country. We've got to protect our people. They are a growing threat, and it's something that we're going to have to confront in the immediate in economic terms. So that's certainly something that that degree, I think, taught me quite a lot about uh, in terms of national security interests. And the only interest that we need to be worried about as Americans is the American national security interest. And that comes first and foremost in all of my thoughts and processes. Riley, thanks so much for your time this morning. As always, I appreciate it. Thank you all so much for having me on. Think about some outro music. We'll do it next time. <laughs> I got it right here for you, dude. There it goes. ACDC rolling it out. <laughs> 